Welcome back, everyone, to My Book of Mormon with me, David Michael. This will be episode 55. That's right. And uh, I had so many announcements that came uh, happen this week that I was sitting on episode 54. I was like, oh, good. I, I've already got that one ready, and uh, I can just release it on Sunday. But so much had come up that I was like, you know what? I, I just can't I can't wait another week to announce all this stuff because it was so exciting. So I decided to release uh, 54 a little early, so you got yourself a midweek freebie on 54. And uh, now, now we're back to the regular schedule with 55. Okay, so this is a big thing that happened. Uh, I know that I told you guys that I was on the Mormon Stories podcast, and uh, that came out last week, Wednesday, I think. And uh, wow, that definitely it got a lot of attention to the show. Uh, so yeah, the, the, the number of downloads just skyrocketed. Um, yeah, quite a few people wanted to, to come check it out after hearing me on that. And, and thanks to all the mimos that wrote me afterwards. A lot of people, uh, thought I did a pretty solid job on that. And, uh, thank you. And, uh, I, I believe most people were impressed with my restraint. <laughs> I think more than anything that, yeah, I wasn't, uh, that I somehow stayed respectful. I don't know. I listened back to it and I thought, man, I'm kind of really dissing their book. And, you know, I felt a little bad about it, but I mean, I think I was being honest, right? I mean, I wasn't making stuff up. So I don't know. Anyway, a lot of people checked out the show as a result. So the, the show got quite a bit of attention. And that's good and bad. So, uh, you know, we got, uh, quite a few, like I said, a lot more listeners jumping on. And it wasn't just like a ton of people just listening to episode one and no one downloading episode two. It seemed like there was, uh, yeah, quite a few people were, were continuing on the journey. So, uh, yeah, I was pretty excited to see that, uh, more listeners out there. But the, the downside is that, yeah, almost immediately got a few one-star reviews. I, I actually think that some people might have given the show one-star reviews without listening to it. Just heard about what I was doing for Mormon Stories and just went into iTunes just to stick it to me. So, yeah, if you if there's any way that you have uh, you know made it all the way to episode 55 and have not done any type of review on, like, Stitcher or iTunes or something like that, I know I said a while ago I wasn't going to ask anymore. But I don't know, I kind of, could you help balance out the little one stars? Because I don't think they're fair. Like, if someone wants to give me a one star for, like, a good reason. But, yeah, one person was like, this is, an, is not a good way to find the Lord. And it's like, no, I, I agree with that. Uh, that's not a one star, though. <laughs> you know what I mean? I actually agree with the review. This is a terrible way if you're looking to find the Lord. Uh, yeah, wrong, wrong way to go about it. So, anyway, whatever. If you haven't, um, that would be the time. Because we kind of need a little, uh, we need to fight back a little. And get, get the, uh, ratings back up to where they used to be. Anyway, uh, so that happened, Mormon Stories. And, uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. And if you haven't checked it out, it is, uh, I put a link to it on the, uh, website, uh, mybookofmormonpodcast.com. One of the links at the top, you'll see it's called David's Guest Appearances. And if you click there, you'll see, uh, you know, it's, it's in chronological order. So you gotta scroll to the bottom and you'll see, uh, Mormon Stories Podcast. So, uh, click that. I think it's episode 513, I think. Don't quote me on that. It's on the site. I have it correct. But anyway, so if you haven't heard it and want to listen to me, it's definitely like the, the kindest, gentlest version you're ever going to hear of me, <laughs> right? Because I knew that, you know, all the other shows I've been on have been like, you can pretty much be yourself and just rah, and swear and drink and do whatever. On that one, got to be a little, uh, a little more, a little more genteel. And, uh, anyway, the, so it's out. The other thing is that we have some more people to thank. So let's do that. So first up, I want to thank. Bishop Tina M. Yeah, what's this? Tina M. Thought that was a priestess. It was, but Tina M. has been promoted to bishop. So, Bishop Tina, welcome to the bishophood. You'll find the hats are a lot more fun here. And uh, you're awesome. Thanks for the email, too. And uh, I thank you so much for your support. And so when uh, Priestess Tina stepped up in a, into the status of bishop, it did free up a slot in the priestess. Yeah, so we had an empty spot, but not for long. Because uh, almost immediately, actually, I think it was the same day, we uh, had... Priestess Melinda Paulson jump on board. That's right. And uh, this was the same Melinda that uh, I mentioned last week that I got to meet in Dallas from the uh, the Dallas with the damn it Dallas people. Yeah. So Priestess Melinda, thank you so much. It was great to meet you, and now it's great to have you in the uh, in the priestesshood. Is that a thing? Priestesshood? I think so. Anyway, you you rock. So thank you. Okay. So moving on. What's that? Wait a minute. Could could it be? I think it is. Ladies and gentlemen of the Mimo family, we are in the presence of yet another Mimo goddess. There she is, Goddess Molly Edwards. Unbelievable. Goddess Carrie, you're no longer alone. You no longer have to look down upon us from heaven all alone, because you now have Goddess Molly Edwards standing beside you. Goddess Molly, thank you so much. Unbelievable. 
amount of uh, generosity that it takes to, to contribute that level of support to the show and uh, and to the to the Taylor scholarship and to everything else that we're doing here with this with this uh, Mimo family. And so Goddess Molly, wow, I am humbled by your generosity and I can't thank you enough. And again to everybody that's helped support the show, you guys are amazing. I've I've never been more proud to be a part of a family as this and Goddess Molly, just thank you and welcome to being a deity. And and officially, the Mimo family is no longer monotheistic. Nope. We now have two goddesses. That's right. So, yeah, I guess we're a polytheistic family now. Kind of fun. Kind of like two goddesses. That's cool. And, uh, yeah, there's a room. There's more room for more. Not, I, don't, I don't think they're selfish up there. They'll, uh, they'll save a seat. If anybody else wants to earn the status of, of god or goddess. So far, only goddesses. And I got to say, this week, wow, the ladies took over. They really did. We had ourselves a new priestess, uh, bishop, and goddess. Mm-hmm. So, thank you to all three of you. Thank you to everybody uh, again, every single week, I, I just get blown away by the amount of generosity that you guys show. And so, thank you. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. Okay. This is a fun intro, right? Man, all kinds of good news all the way around. All right. But now, we uh, we have to leave all that fun behind and jump back into Alma. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Alma's tons of fun, right? Uh, no. At least there's lots of war. You know? That's pretty good. So, we are starting with Alma 61. And last I heard, Moroni and Helaman were like whining to actually more than whining back to Pahoran, who is uh, like the governor of Zarahemla. And he's like, you didn't send enough supplies. So we're going to come kill you. <laughs> it was pretty, uh, yeah, they were not happy with him. And I remember thinking like, well, you don't know why I didn't send supplies. There could have been any number of reasons, but they weren't having it. They're like, send us supplies or we are coming there to kill you. So, well, that's where we left off. I think pretty sure. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, chapter 61, let's do this. Behold, now it came to pass, drink, that soon after Moroni had sent his epistle unto the chief governor, he realized an epistle from Pahoran, the chief governor. Wait, what? Oh, I'm sorry, he received, not he realized. Okay, and these are the words which he received. Okay, so Pahoran is uh, writing back. I wonder if he's already gotten this uh, pretty pretty mean epistle from Moroni. Moroni did not hold back. He was like, you're a piece of crap, I'm going to come kill you. So let's see what a Pahoran has to say. All right. I, Pahoran, who am the chief governor of this land, do send these words unto Moroni, the chief captain over the army. Behold, I say unto you, Moroni, that I do not joy in your great afflictions. Yea, drink, it grieves my soul. But behold, these are the words who do joy in your afflictions. Wait, there are the, I'm sorry, there are those who do joy in your afflictions. Yea, drink, insomuch that they have risen up in rebellion against me, and also those of my people who are free men. Yea, drink again, and those who have risen up are exceedingly numerous. Hmm, so sounds like... Well, Moroni, maybe a little foot in your mouth there, talking all this crap about your buddy uh, Pahoran. Turns out he's battling a little civil war on his hands. Yeah, maybe that's why I couldn't send you all those troops. He's got, a, he's got an insurrection going on. Well, I think you owe him an apology, sir. I'm just saying, Moroni, you were not very nice to this man. Okay. I mean, you guys remember that, right? Moroni was like, you're a traitor. You're a disgusting. How can you turn your, how can you forget God's commandments? You piece of crap. I mean, he was just like letting him have it. The whole time Pahoran's like, oh, sorry. Sorry that I have a rebellion going on and I have to deal with that. Sorry I only sent you 2,000 troops, you big whiner. Telling you, Marona, you, you definitely, you should be sending like a box of chocolates. <laughs> not just, not just, I'm sorry. You need, you need roses and chocolates to make it up to him. Okay. And it is those who have sought to take away the judgment seat from me that have been the cause of this great iniquity. For they have used great flattery and they have led away the hearts of many people, which will be the cause of sore afflictions among us. And they have withheld our provisions and have daunted our free men that they have not come unto you. And behold, they have driven me out before them, and I have fled into the land of Gideon, as with many men, as it were possible that I could get. Wow. So this is a, this is a successful rebellion. So it sounds like whoever it was that sought power, we don't know who they are yet, but some group dethroned Pahoran there and uh, kicked him out. So he, he fled to the land of Gideon. Yeah, Pahoran, you didn't get killed. Might want to count your blessings there. And behold, I have sent a proclamation throughout this part of the land, and behold, they are flocking to us daily to their arms in the defense of their country and their freedom, and to avenge our wrongs. And they have come unto us, and so much that those who have risen up in rebellion against us are set at defiance. Yea, drink, in so much that they do fear us and durst not come out against us to battle. And the last verse didn't make a heck of a lot of sense. I don't know why they wouldn't want to fight. But anyway, the, uh, you no, know, Zarahemla is now in the hand of rebels. Pretty exciting. I don't know uh, what their like what their cause is, why they rebelled. I assume we're going to get to that. Just so far, they just they did. 
Okay. They've got possession of the land or the city of Zarahemla. They have appointed a king over them, and he hath written unto the king of the Lamanites, in which he hath joined an alliance with him. Hmm. Wow. Okay. In the which alliance he hath agreed to maintain the city of Zarahemla, which maintenance he supposeth will enable the Lamanites to conquer the remainder of the land, and he shall be placed king over this people when they shall be conquered under the Lamanites. Well, there you go. Okay. So these, uh, these rebellious folk, I wonder if these are the king men. Well, no, all the king men got killed, didn't they? I'm pretty sure. Moroni took care of them. Everybody that wanted a king, dead. So they, uh, they kicked out the, the governor and replaced him with a king. I don't know. It kind of sounds like just a, it sounds like semantics, right? What's the difference? Eh, whatever. But they now have a king. And not only that, so they got a king and all the Nephites are like, well, you have to die. So they did the prudent thing. I'm like, well, Nephites are just going to come kill us. We should probably side with someone else. And oh yeah, there's only one other side. So they uh, allied with the Lamanites. And uh, if the Lamanites win the day and conquer the Nephites, then this new king over Zarahemla will be king over all the Nephites, it sounds like. I think that's the deal he made. Yeah, that's a pretty good deal. I mean, what's his other choice? Try and defend this one city against all the Nephites that are going to try and kill him? I mean, if I'm if I'm king over Zarahemla, all the Nephites want me dead. I'm thinking it's the, good, it's the right call to ally with the Lamanites. So I'll give him that. And now in your epistle, you have censured me, but it matters not. I am not angry. <laughs> really? Pahoran, you have the right to be angry. He, he called you mean names. <laughs> anyway, but do rejoice in the greatness of your heart. I, Pahoran, do not seek for power, save only to retain my judgment seat, that I may preserve the rights and liberty of my people. My soul standeth fast in that liberty in which God hath made us free. And now behold, we will resist wickedness even unto bloodshed. We will not shed the blood of the Lamanites if they would stay in their own land. You liars. You would. You know you would. You know, Alma went up there and uh, killed people when he was a missionary. He did. Uh, Ammon, woo, he went up there and killed all kinds of people. Yeah, none of this like, oh, if, if the Lamanites just minded their own business, we'd leave them alone. Nonsense. You would not. <laughs> it's just, we haven't so far. Anyway, okay. Hey, the other thing funny, I'm going to go back a bit. So I get the Pohoran's like, I'm not angry that you, like, called me names, but isn't Pohoran a little angry that, like, wow, you were going to come kill me, and you were going to come, like, you know, remove the the elected government and have a military dictatorship? Like, wait a minute. What, I thought we were on the same side here, side of liberty. And, uh, yeah, I think I think Pohoran, even if he's not angry, should at least be scratching his head, like, uh, I might have a madman out there with a lot with a big army. Hmm, just saying. Okay. All right, so where did we leave off? Yeah, they wouldn't they wouldn't kill Lamanites if they stayed in their own land. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We would not shed the blood of our brethren if they would not rise up in rebellion and take the sword against us. You did before. You killed like 4,000 of them just because they wanted a king. Hmm. Anyway, we would subject ourselves to the yoke of bondage if it were requisite with the justice of God, or if he should command us to do so. <laughs> okay, I wonder how God would do that. Hey, you guys, be slaves. Yeah, <laughs> okay. But behold, he doth not command us, when we shall subject ourselves to our enemies, but that we shall put our trust in him, and he will deliver us. That's convenient, right? Oh, yeah, if God told us to, to just surrender, we would. But, you know, he's telling he's not telling us to do that. Well, okay, sure. Uh, therefore, my beloved brother, Moroni, let us resist evil. And whatsoever evil we cannot resist with our words, yea, drink, such as rebellious and dissensions. Let us resist them with our swords, that we may re retain our freedom. We may rejoice in our great privilege of our church, and the cause of our Redeemer and our God. Therefore, come unto me speedily with a few of your men, and leave the remainder in charge of Lehi and Tian come. Oh, I said that wrong. Sorry, everybody. Leave them in charge of Lehi and Tian come. There we go. Give unto them the power to conduct the war in that part of the land, according to the Spirit of God, which is also the Spirit of freedom which is in them. All right, so Lehi, he's way back. He's been in a lot of battles. Tian come, he's 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 a fighter, he's a scrapper. So that's pretty good. That's a pretty good plan. If you got to leave the army up there, you know, to keep fighting the Lamanites that you don't want to fight. Yeah, Lehi and Tian come. That's pretty good. Pretty good plan. And then uh, Moroni and I guess Helaman are going to come back to Zarahemla to try and uh, and deal with this rebellion. Yeah. Behold, I have sent a few provisions unto them, that they may not perish until ye can come unto me. Gather together whatsoever force ye can upon your march hither. And we will go speedily against those dissenters in the strength of our God, according to the faith which is in us. And we will take possession of the city of Zarahemla, that we may obtain more food to send forth unto Lehi and Tiancum. Yea, drink! We will go forth against them in the strength of the Lord, and we will put an end to this great iniquity. And now, Moroni, I do joy in receiving your epistle. <laughs> really? <laughs> okay. I guess, uh, Pahoran likes to get, uh, likes to get talked down to. He's got joy in reading it. There you go. 
For I was somewhat worried concerning that we should do, whether it should be just in us to go against our brethren. But ye have said, except they repent, the Lord hath commanded that ye should go against them. See that ye strengthen Lehi and Teancom and the Lord. Tell them to fear not, for God will deliver them. Yea, drink, and also all those who stand fast in that liberty, wherewith God hath made them free. And now I close mine epistle to my beloved brother Moroni. So yeah, that's that's great. So basically, Lehi and Teancom, don't worry, have trust in God and he'll, and he'll, he'll win the day for you. Right. He'll deliver you. You'll be fine. Why don't they just do that down there? Like, why Why doesn't Pahoran just put some more faith in God and then God will deliver him? I, I, it didn't work for you. Why do you think it's going to work for them? Because I assume that he had faith in God and yet the rebellion kicked him out. So I don't know. I, I'm not sure when trusting God wins and when you actually need more troops. It's confusing. I'm not I'm not really sure. Okay, that was in a 61, turning the page. Not done yet. We are uh, Alma chapter 62. All right, we're going to keep going. And, uh, yeah, I just keep going. And now it came to pass drink that when Moroni had received this epistle, his heart did take courage and was filled with exceedingly great joy because of the faithfulness of Boran. And he was not, <laughs> that he was not also a traitor to the freedom of the cause of his country. <laughs> so Moroni is happy that there was a, a rebellion and an insurrection that kicked Pahoran out of office. That just makes him, it just fills him with exceeding joy because, uh, because then he found out, oh, Pahoran wasn't an a-hole. He just got a, he just had no troops to send. Yeah. Yeah. Moroni, seriously, the next thing you should do, you know, send a little apology note, a little present, just saying. All right, but he did also mourn exceedingly because of the iniquity of those who had driven Pahoran from the judgment seat. Yea, drink in Fine because of those who had rebelled against their country and also their God. Mm. And it came to pass drink, the Moroni took a small number of men, according to the desire of Pahoran, and gave Lehi and Teancom command over the remainder of his army, and took his march towards the land of Gideon. <sighs> I wish he, I wonder which men he took. Hmm. Like, did he take any of those, uh, 2,000 under, you know, the, the child soldiers that can't be killed? I think I should take with him. Cause then he wouldn't need many. He just bring like a dozen. Send them in, send them into, uh, Zarahemla. They'll kill all the, uh, all the re re rebels. Problem solved. Okay, he did raise the standard of liberty in whatsoever place he did enter. Oh, yeah, this thing. And gained whatsoever force he could in all his march towards the land of Gideon. Ah, oh, man. I, I really, really need someone to write in and explain to me how the standard of liberty is, like, an important thing. I, I it sounded weird when I first read it. Dude rips his robe, and he wrote some stuff on it. I should probably look up what that stuff was. I don't remember it being very monumental. It was just some nonsense. And then he put it on a big pole and started waving it around. But this thing keeps coming up and everyone keeps referencing it. Like, oh, the standard of liberty. And I'm like, what, what, what? That's a thing? That's important? So, yeah, I would like someone to explain why. Is it just like a flag? Is, is that what it is? It's like because a patriotic thing? Just a flag that, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to stop guessing. Somebody else tell me because I don't understand why that thing is so, why that would inspire anyone. Some ripped up clothes with some writing on it. Anyway, on a pole, no less. Okay. And it came to pass drink that thousands did flock unto his standard. See? Thousands. They're just like, oh, look, it's the ripped robe. Let's go. Ah. I don't get it. Anyway. And did take up their swords in the defense of their freedom, that they might not come into bondage. And thus, when Moroni had gathered together whatsoever men he could in all his march, he came to the land of Gideon, and uniting his forces with those of Pahoran, they became exceedingly strong, even stronger than the men of Pachos. Who the heck is Pachos? Pachos? Pachos. Let's say Pachos. P-A-C-H-U-S. We'll go Pachos. Okay. Uh, who was king of those dissenters who had driven the free men out of the land of Zarahemla and had taken possession of the land. Okay, so King Pachus is the, uh, he's the leader of the rebels in Zarahemla. All right. It's a pretty good name. Pachus. I like it. And it came to pass drink, but Moroni and Pahoran went down with their armies into the land of Zarahemla and went forth against the city and did meet the men of Pachus insomuch that they did come to battle. Aha, here we go. Yeah, remember how excited I used to get when there was a battle coming? We've had so many chapters of battles. I have not really paused to appreciate the fact that we're still in battle chapters. And so I'm sorry, everybody. I should, you know, that's just, this is a good thing. You know, at any moment, this could go back to like, oh, my grandson, let me prophesy unto you. And, you know, let's, let's, let's just enjoy this while we've got it before it starts to get boring again. And we've got battle after battle after battle in these chapters. Not so bad. Okay, here we go. And behold, Pachas was slain and his men were taken prisoners and Bahoran was restored to his judgment seat. Okay, shortest battle ever. Man, did I pick a wrong time to get excited about a battle. <laughs> that was that was it. So they came into battle, and uh, Patches lost, and uh, Pahoran's back. Get great. That's uh, okay. All right. So that's the end of the battle. And uh, hmm. Okay. Next. And the men of Patches received their trial according to the law, and also those king men who had been taken and cast into prison. 
and they were executed according to the law. Oh, isn't that lovely? Yea, drink! Those men of Pachos and those kingmen, who ever would not take up arms in the defense of their country, but would fight against it, were put to death. Well, there you go. That's the answer. Unbelievable. Could you imagine if in a civil war the with us, the winning side just instantly executed everyone on the other side? Like, imagine the uh, the American Civil War, right? Imagine if it was like, okay, sign the treaty now, line up every single rebel, millions of them, and just just kill them. Like, yeah, that's uh, that's the thing to do. These Nephites, they are they are really mean. Anyway, I, I, thank goodness they didn't give us a number because then it would have been probably a lot. It's my guess. So anyway, sad. Sorry guys, they were all executed. So man, that's kind of sad, don't you think? They just wanted a king. So that's all they wanted. They don't like judges. They want a king. Now they're all dead. For the second time, they uh, they wiped them out. Extermination of the kingmen. All right, moving on. And thus it became expedient that this law should be strictly observed for the safety of their country. <laughs> the safety of their country. Yea, drink, and whosoever was found denying their freedom was speedily executed according to the law. Wow. Anyone found denying their freedom. That is something that you could, work, you know, interpret very loosely. So, uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is not a nice place to live. If anyone thinks you're denying their freedom, death. Mm, rough, rough town. And thus ended the thirtieth year of the reign of the judges over the people of Nephi, Moroni and Pahoran having restored peace to the land of Zarahemla among their own people, having inflicted death upon all those who were not true to the cause of freedom. That's unbelievable. They're proud of this. This is a holy book, and they're like bragging about this. These men of God that, you know, killed everyone that disagreed with them politically. Yes, well, it's just, that's terrible. I know. And it came to pass drink in the commencement of the thirty and first year of the reign of the judges over the people of Nephi, Moroni immediately caused that provisions should be sent, and also an army of six thousand men should be sent unto Helaman to assist him in preserving that part of the land. And he also caused that an army of six thousand men with a sufficient quantity of food should be sent to the armies of Lehi, Lehi and Tiancum. And it came to pass drink when this was done to fortify the land against the Lamanites. There you go. And it sounds like they're going to get a, a fresh, fresh uh, dose of troops. Looks like, uh, let's see, 12,000 in total, I think. Yeah, 6,000 going to Helaman, and another 6,000 going to Lehi and T and Come. There you go. So, uh, quite a few more soldiers into the, into the battle up there. Is there still a battle up there? Yeah, there is, right? Because the Lamanites just took Nephi Ha, I think. Yeah, Nephi Ha. And it was weird because Nephi Ha had, like, people from all these other cities in it for some reason. And, uh, yeah, the uh, Lamanites took it. So they have to get that back, at least. All right. And it came to pass drink that Moroni and Pahoran, leaving a large body of men in the land of Zarahemla, took their march with a large body of men towards the land of Nephi Ha, being determined to overthrow the Lamanites in that city. And it came to pass drink, as they were marching towards the land, they took a large body of men in the, of the Lamanites and slew many of them, and took their provisions and their weapons of war. And there you go. So, uh, one, yeah, one large army encountered another large army. Sounds like the uh, Nephites, the one that won that battle, uh, slew a lot of them. Doesn't say how many, just, just many of them. And uh, took the crap. There you go. So uh, things are looking up for the Nephites so far. This is a good, is a good, uh, good campaign. And it came to pass, drink after they had taken them, they caused them to enter into a covenant that they would no more take up their weapons of war against the Nephites. Well, that's fantastic. So if you're actually the enemy, right, and uh, and you fight against the Nephites, they'll just say, "Hey, promise, promise to be nice, and you can live." And uh, yeah, but the uh, but if you're a Nephite and you dare to question anything, you, you're immediately executed. So that's great. I love that the uh, the Lamanites actually get better treatment than their own people do. Okay, and when they had entered into this covenant, they sent them to dwell with the people of Ammon, and they were in number about four thousand who had not been slain. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I don't know how many were slain, but four thousand of them weren't. So not only did you have to promise that you wouldn't uh, fight the Nephites anymore, you had to go be an Ammonite. Oof, that's rough, because the Ammonites, uh, they're like the pacifists. So what are these soldiers going to do if they're pacifists? They don't have a farm. They don't have any trade. They're soldiers. Oh, well, time to learn, trying to learn a new trick there, uh, uh, Lamanites that are now Ammonites. I don't know what you're going to do with yourselves, but I uh, hope you learn how to farm. And it came to pass drink, and that when they had sent them away, they pursed their march towards the land of Nephi. -ha. And it came to pass drink again, that when they had come to the city of Nephi, -ha, they did pitch their tents in the plains of Nephi, -ha, which is near the city of Nephi. -ha. <sighs> I, I don't know. I don't know why they're so, they name everything the same. Near the river of Nephi, -ha, and the Nephi -ha Street, which intersects with Nephi -ha Boulevard. Anyway, nah, just annoying. The city, the plain, the, it's all the same. And I think there's a guy named Nephi, -ha too. Yeah, that's not confusing at all. 
Now Moroni was desirous that the Lamanites should come out to battle against them upon the plains, but the Lamanites, knowing their exceedingly great courage and beholding the greatness of their numbers, therefore they durst not come out against them. Therefore they durst not come to battle in that day. I am so sick of this book telling us that the attackers of a defended position really want the defenders to come out from behind their defensive positions and fight them in the open battlefield. Of course they want that. But they're not good. And then it's like, oh, but the side that's on the defense has decided not to. Of course they decided not to. Why would they? Although the Lamanites do come out all the time when they see a smaller army. Oh, I swear if they do, if this, if they tell that same story again a fourth time, and there's a little army and all the Lamanites run after them and they just take the city. I might just stop reading this book. That, that will be too ridiculous. That's more ridiculous than a brass ball showing. I, I'm sorry. We'll see. We'll just see. Okay. And when the night came, Moroni went forth in the darkness of the night and came upon the top of the wall to spy out in what part of the city the Lamanites did camp with their army. And then it came to pass drink that they were on the east by the entrance, and they were all asleep. And now Mor Moroni returned to his army and caused that they should prepare in haste strong cords and ladders to be let down from the top of the wall into the inner part of the wall. Hmm. I guess these uh, Lamanites, when they said they were all asleep, they meant all asleep. Not even any guards on the wall. I'm telling you. Not very bright. All right. So Moroni is uh, sneaking in at night over the walls that are somehow uh, unguarded. And it came to pass drink that Moroni caused that his men should march forth and come upon the top of the wall and let themselves down into that part of the city, yea, drink, even on the west, where the Lamanites did not camp with their armies. And it came to pass drink, and they were all let down into the city by night. My God, he got his whole army in there? Man, this is weird. Why would you even bother being behind a wall if you weren't going to put anyone up there to keep an eye on it? I don't know. Somehow they got their entire army over this wall. I, I find that incredibly hard to believe, but we're just going to keep going. Uh, by the means of their strong cords and their ladders, thus when the morning came, they were all within the walls of the city. <laughs> okay, we just have to uh, just have to move on, because uh, that that I, I refuse to believe that that's even possible with the numbers that we're talking about here. How do you get thousands of people to scale a wall in one night and no one notice in that city? It's not. It it just couldn't happen. But I have to move on. Because, uh, yeah, just because it's impossible doesn't mean we shouldn't let truth get in the way of a good story. I think that's what I'm saying. So we're moving on. And now when the Lamanites awoke and saw that their armies of Moroni were within the walls, they were affrighted exceedingly. I imagine. Imagine in so much that they did flee out by the pass. Okay. So Lamanites woke up and they're like, we didn't want to fight. You're in our city. That, that's freaky. How? But I would probably would have thought the same. If I woke up and the entire army was inside the city, I'd be like, magic, magic. There's no other explanation. <laughs> Anyway, here we go. And now when Moroni saw that they were fleeing before him, he did cause that his men should march forth against them, and slew many, and surrounded many others, and took them prisoners, and the remainder of them fled into the land of Moroni, which was in the borders by the seashore. Uh, that's, that's Moroni for you. People uh, running for their lives, and he just cuts them down in cold blood? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that sounds... That's, that's, that's Moroni. At least he's staying true to his character. Thus had Moroni and Pahoran obtained the possession of the city nephi -ha, without the loss of one soul. Really? What about all these uh, people that were trying to run away that you just killed? Yeah, I'm pretty sure they had souls. All right. There were many of the Lamanites who were slain. Oh, wait a minute. I didn't finish the sentence. So without the loss of one soul, meaning a, a Nephite soul, uh, plenty of Lamanite souls. I love it that they don't say many Lamanite souls were lost. No, they don't have souls. Nah, they're dark. Yeah, evil. Oh. <laughs> anyway. Now it came to pass drink. Many of the Lamanites that were prisoners were desirous to join the people of Ammon and become a free people. <laughs> I would imagine. Because uh, your choices are probably going to be become an Ammonite or die here on the spot. So it's amazing how desirous they are to join the people of Ammon. Yeah. And it came to pass drink that as many as were desirous unto them, it was granted according to their desires. Therefore, all the prisoners of the Lamanites did join the people of Ammon. <laughs> I love it. It's amazing. Every single one of them chose uh, <laughs> to be an Ammonite instead of dying. It's amazing how that happened. All right. And they did begin to labor exceedingly, tilling the ground, raising all manner of grains and flocks and herds of every kind. And thus were the Nephites relieved from a great burden. Yea, drink, insomuch that they were relieved from all the prisoners of the Lamanites. Now, this is a win-win, because uh, Lamanites didn't want to feed them, right? So that's why that's probably why they just killed them all the time. And uh, But now it's like, not only do we not have to feed them, hey, they're actually like giving us crops and stuff. Because remember, the Ammonites get taxed pretty heavily, because they don't, they don't defend themselves. And so the Nephites have this kind of uh, arrangement with them. We'll defend you, but we get a cut of everything you got. So now they have these prisoners of war work in the fields, and they get a cut. This is pretty good, pretty good system. Not bad. Not bad. I don't know whose idea this was, but this whole like send them to Ammon. Not bad. And you're not going to get in a line with Ammon in charge. You lose your arm. Yeah. This is this is pretty. I'm. I like it. This is this is smart. I'm not saying 
I mean, it is kind of kind of slavery, right? I mean, you're you're pretty much telling someone you can either die or go work this field. You know what I mean? So this is a form of slavery. So I don't know if I should. I'm not saying I endorse it, but I'm saying uh, for their purposes, this seems to be a pretty good strategy. You know, as long as you can overlook the fact that you've just enslaved a bunch of people. Okay, now it came to pass drink that Moroni, after he had obtained possession of the city Nephi, huh? after taking many prisoners, which did reduce the armies of the Lamanites exceedingly, and having regained many of the Nephites who had been taken prisoners, which did strengthen the army of Moroni exceedingly. Therefore, Moroni went forth from the land of Nephi huh? to the land of Lehi. All right. Is Lehi in the Lamanites' hands? I don't even know anymore. I, these, these cities flip back and forth so often, I have the foggiest idea. And it came to pass drink, that when the Lamanites saw that Moroni was coming against them, they were again frightened and fled before the army of Moroni. Hmm, where were these Lamanites? Were they in the land? I guess they were in the land of Lehi. And uh, they got scared, and they took off. Okay. Um, and it came to pass drink, that Moroni and his army did pursue them from city to city until they were met by Lehi and Teancum. When the Lamanites fled from Lehi and Teancum, even down upon the borders of the seashore, until they came to the land of Moroni. Well, this is some sort of chase going on here. With the, you got like three Nephite armies chasing these Lamanites. So there you go. And the armies of the Lamanites were all gathered together, insomuch that they were all in one body in the land of Moroni. Now, Amoron, the king of the Lamanites, was also with them. Yeah, Amoron, I don't think you've, uh, you have, it does not seem like you have had a very wise retreat. Mm -mm. Seems like you've just uh, gathered all your troops in one spot, and it also sounds like the water's at your back. This doesn't, this doesn't sound good for you. Yeah. I think you're about to get uh, about to get wiped out with the classic encirclement maneuver, is my guess. I don't know, but this is what I'm thinking is about to happen. And then it came to pass drink that Moroni and Lehi and Teancum did encamp with their armies round about in the borders of the land of Moroni, insomuch that the Lamanites were encircled about by the borders of the wilderness on the south and the borders of the wilderness on the east. All right, I was wrong about it being water. I thought, I thought for some reason they were by water. No, but it sounds like it's still the same thing. They have them encircled using the using the terrain to their advantage, so they basically... You got an army on one side, you got the wilderness on the other side, so they've got them pretty trapped. Because, you know, if you go in the wilderness, you're doomed. Everybody knows that. So, and thus they did encamp for the night. For behold, the Nephites and the Lamanites were also weary because of the greatness of the march. Therefore, they did not resolve upon any stratagem in the nighttime, save it were Teancum, for he was exceedingly angry with Amoron, insomuch that he considered that Amoron and Amalekai, his brother, had been the cause of this great and lasting war between them and the Lamanites, which had been the cause of so much war and bloodshed, yea, drink, and so much famine. Okay, so it sounds like uh, Teancum, he's, uh, he sounds like he's uh, going on a motion here. He wants, he wants revenge. He wants blood. This is not, he's not going for a just victory. He wants, he wants his pound of flesh. Okay. And it came to pass drink that Teancum, in his anger, did go forth into the camp of the Lamanites and did let himself down over the walls of the city. <laughs> why not? I don't know why they bother having a city. You can just climb over the walls whenever you want. And he went forth with a cord from place to place, and so much that he did find the king, and he did cast a javelin at him. <laughs> One guy, this is amazing, <laughs> which did pierce him near the heart. Uh, but behold, the king did awaken his servants before he died, in so much that they did pursue Teancum and slew him. Wow, amazing. So uh, Teancum, first of all, Teancum's like a general, right? Like, he doesn't send in some special forces unit. He doesn't send any of his uh, you know, elite troops in there to do this. No, he goes himself, and he goes alone. That's that's genius. And then somehow he actually and remember, the Nephites and the Lamanites don't look alike, right? The Lamanites are dark and the Nephites are white. I mean, this is like it'd be pretty obvious that you got a white guy wandering around your camp and he's just looking at every tent like, oh, excuse me, is, where's your king? And you're walking on this big javelin. Yeah. You know, where's your king? Oh, third tent on the left. Thank you so much. It's like, oh, what are you doing here? Oh, nothing. Just want to say hi to the king, you know, with this javelin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're supposed to believe that this happened. This this entire reading today has been uh, quite a bit of a suspension of disbelief that you have to you have to introduce. Anyway, all right. So, uh, but 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 you know, this was a really dumb plan of Tiancom, and it looks like he paid for it with his life. He stabbed the uh, king in the in the chest, didn't kill him. King says guards, and the guards came in, and then they killed Tiancom. So no more Tiancom. He he's a goner, and uh, I imagine that uh, no more King a moron. Yeah, yeah, before he died. So Amoron's dead, Tiancum's dead. So it sounds like there was a little, it was kind of a little kamikaze attack on Tiancum, a little suicide mission, right? So he's a little uh, suicide bomber. I mean, there's no way he could have expected to live. You can't just walk in by yourself to an enemy camp and go kill the king and just walk out, you know? So, yeah, a little bit of a little suicide attack. Suicide bomber, Tiancum. Okay. Now it came to pass when Lehi and Moroni knew that Tiancum was dead, they were exceedingly sorrowful. But behold, 
He had been a man who had fought valiantly for his country, yea, drink, a true friend of liberty, and he had suffered many exceedingly sore afflictions. But behold, he was dead, and he had gone to the way of all the earth. Hmm, he's dead, yeah. Yeah, I guess uh, fighting, being a, a, a suicide mission is fighting valiantly. Well, yeah. even though he wasn't ordered to, mm -mm, he just did it. Yeah, one guy on his own, mad, killed, just went and murdered someone. That's great. Now it came to pass drink that Moroni marched forth on the morrow and came upon the Lamanites, and so much that they did slay them with great slaughter. And they did drive them out of the land, and they did flee, even that they did not return at that time against the Nephites. All right, we don't know. Again, we've uh, it's it's hard to know the size of these battles because sometimes we get numbers and sometimes we don't. But we've been told at times like tens of thousands. And so when they say great slaughter, I'm actually worried to even speculate how many people might have just died. It might have been a lot. So maybe we don't know. But anyway, the uh, Lamanites just just lost, it just resoundingly lost just about everything. They lost their city, their army, their king. They're done. This is this war is over. That's it seems like it anyway. And thus ended the thirty and first year of the reign of the judges over the people of Nephi. And thus they had wars and bloodsheds and famine and affliction for the space of many years. Yeah, they, they certainly have. What's this famine? I don't remember famine, but apparently they did. Okay. And there had been murders and contentions and dissensions and all manner of iniquity among the people of Nephi. Nevertheless, for the righteous' sake, yea, drink, because of the prayers of the righteous, they were spared. Hmm. So, sounds like there were a lot of Nephites that were up to no good and some that weren't. Well, here's, I thought when they were saying 31 years have gone by and they've, they have had like a bunch of wars and bloodshed, would that mean that like they're skipping ahead a few years and a bunch of bad stuff happened? Hmm. Not sure. We'll keep an eye on that and we'll find out. But behold, because of the exceedingly great length of the wars between the Nephites and the Lamanites, many had become hardened because of the exceedingly great length of the war, and many were softened because of their afflictions, and so much that they did humble themselves before God, even in the depth of humility. Okay, so I, I think they were just referencing the war that's been going on for a while, because that's been going on for a while. So, you know, a, a long-fought conflict definitely takes its toll on any society. Absolutely. Look at Europe after either world war. Then it came to pass drink that after Moroni had fortified those parts of the land which were most exposed to the Lamanites. How are there still Lamanites? I don't get it. It's like the kilt resoundingly defeated them. All right. Until they were sufficiently strong, he returned to the city of Zarahemla, and also Helaman returned to the place of his inheritance, and there was once more peace established in the people of Nephi. There you go. The war is officially done. And Moroni yielded up command of his armies into the hands of his son, whose name was, oh, come on, Moroniha. Moroniha. Yeah, why not? It's probably like Moroniha. Who cares? I'm just calling him Moroniha. Sure. And he retired to his own house that he might spend the remainder of his days in peace. Yeah. And just reflect on the thousands of innocent people you've killed, Moroni. Hope you can sleep at night. And I love that, like, even the the uh, the military leadership is hereditary, right? So it's not like Moroni gave command to the second in command. No, he gave it to his son. I don't understand why these people are so against kings. Like, they're, Moroni has acted like a king through most of the m most of the story, in in to the extent that he like gave his generalship to his son, who has a terrible name. All right. And Pahoran did return to his judgment seat, and Helaman did take upon him again to preach unto the people the word of God, for because so many wars and contentions, it had become expedient that a regulation should be made again in the church. Hmm, a regulation in the church. Sounds like they're going back to theocracy. Therefore Helaman and his brethren went forth, and did declare the word of God with much power under the convincing of many people of their wickedness, which did cause them to repent of their sins and to be baptized unto the Lord their God. All right, so Helaman and his, bro his brethren, whoever they are, sounds like they're... Uh, Actually, we should know, right? Helaman's brothers. I don't remember. But Helaman's one of Alma's sons. Alma Jr., anyway. And it came to pass drink. Well, actually, I was going to say that, you know, they're, they're successfully converting people. Okay. So we got the drink. They did establish again the church of God throughout all the land. There we go. <laughs> I guess when they're at war, the church just, like, closes down shop or something. Yay, drink. And regulations were made concerning the law, and their judges and their chief judges were chosen. Yeah. Sounds like they're going right back to theocracy. Yeah. And the people of Nephi began to prosper again in the land, and began to multiply and wax exceedingly strong again in the land, and they began to grow exceedingly rich. Mm, uh-oh. Here it comes again. But notwithstanding their riches or their strength or their prosperity, they were not lifted up in the pride of their eyes, neither were they slow to remember the Lord their God, but they did humble themselves exceedingly before him. Now I'm confused. I really thought this book told us being rich is just a no, 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 no. Yeah. But now it's saying you can be rich as long as you're not proud of it. How can you not be proud of it? Doesn't make any, I, don't know, I don't know. Whatever. I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if we're allowed to have money or not. <sighs> this book. Confusing. Okay. This is my problem. 
Like, uh, even when I was on Mormon Stories, it's like, has this book made you want to be a better person? I'm like, I'm not sure how. I don't know what the rules are. Am I supposed to give all my rich money away? Am I supposed to have it but not be proud of it? I, I don't know. All right. Yay, drink. They did remember how great things the Lord God had done for them, and he delivered them from death and from bonds and from prisons and from all manner of afflictions, and he had delivered them out of the hands of their enemies. And they did pray unto the Lord their God continually, insomuch that the Lord did bless them. According to his word, so they did wax strong and prosper in the land. And it came to pass, drink, that all these things were done. And Helaman died. Oh, and Helaman died. Sorry, Helaman's dead, everybody. Sad. In the thirty and fifth year of the reign of the judges over the people of Nephi. See you later, Helaman. You're a fine general. And it sounds like a pretty good uh, missionary, too, at the end. Yeah, not bad. I'm a jack of all trades. That was 62. Meh. I'm I'm feeling it. I'm going I'm going for one more. Sixty three, Alma. And this might be a little bit of a long episode. I'm not sure how long sixty three is, but we're doing it. Here we go. And it came to pass drink in the commencement of the thirty and sixth year of the reign of the judges over the people of Nephi, that Shiblon took possession of those sacred things which had been delivered unto Helaman by Alma. What, like the plates and stuff, probably? I think so. And he was a just man, and he did walk uprightly before God, and he did observe to do continually, I'm sorry, to do good continually, to keep the commandments of the Lord his God, and also did his brother. And it came to pass drink, that Moroni died also. Man, everyone's dying out. And very peacefully, they're all just dying. Hmm. And thus ended the thirty and sixth year of the reign of the judges. So Moroni is dead, Tian comes dead, Helaman's dead, man, dropping like a moron's dead, they're all dying. All right. And came to pass drink, in the thirty and seventh year of the reign of the judges, there was a large company of men, even to the amount of five thousand and four hundred men, with their wives and their children, departed out of the land of Zarahemla into the land which was northward. Why? Why, why is this happening? I don't know. Suddenly there's a mass migration out of the land of Zarahemla going north. Hmm. And it came to pass drink that Hagoth, I swear that's his name, Hagoth, uh, he being an exceedingly curious man, therefore he went forth and built him an exceedingly large ship on the borders of the land Bountiful, by the land Desolation, and it, and launched it forth into the West Sea, by the narrow neck which led into the land northward. What's happening? What 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 is going on? All of a sudden, you know, these five thousand people, they just like randomly said, yeah, they they left Zarahemla and they're going north. Moving on, no more mention of then. And then we have Hagoth, who's like, I'm going to build a boat, and I'm just going to sail. I'm curious. I'm just want to know what's out there. Okay great. And behold, there were many of the Nephites who did enter therein and did sail forth with much provisions and also many women and children that they took their course northward. And thus ended the 30 and 7th year. What? What is that? Uh, so it sounds like a lot of people got on this boat with Hagoth and uh, now all these people are leaving and going no across water north for I don't know why. Okay. And in the 30 and 8th year, this man built other ships. And the first ship did also return, and many more people did enter into it, and they also took much of their provisions and set out again into land northward. Why? Why is this happening? Did they, like, run out of land? Do they need to... I, hmm, I don't have no idea. This just came out of nowhere, right? Well, like, talking about this story, and it was kind of felt like it was wrapping up a little, didn't it? You know, kind of our main protagonists were dying, and, you know, old age, and they're retiring, and everything's fine, and it's like, and then a dude built a ship, and we all started trying. It's like, what? Whoa! <laughs> you know? I don't know why... Why, why, why is this happening? Okay. We'll just, we're just going to keep going. I got, I got boats. And it came to pass drink. They were never heard of more. Wow. And we suppose that they were drowned in the depths of the sea. Ooh. Okay. And it came to pass drink that one other ship did sail forth. And whither she did go, we know not. What is this? Just getting sad. So there's just like ships of, uh, of like colonists or something. And they're going off to sea and they're just sinking. That's, that's great. And it came to pass drink that in this year, there were many people who went forth into the land northward. We have no idea why, and thus ended the thirty and eighth year. So are some of them making it? Oh, this got weird. I guess some people are making it across this water, some aren't. Still have no idea why they're going. But some sort of mass migration. People do not want to live in uh, Zarahemla, apparently. They would rather go drown at sea than live there. Hmm. And he came to pass drink. In the thirty and ninth year of the reign of the judges, Shiblon died also. Okay. And uh, by Shiblon. And Coriantan had gone forth to the land northward in a ship to carry forth provisions unto the people who had gone forth into that land. Okay, so some people did make it into this, whatever the land north is, and Coriantan is uh, going to give him some supplies. Therefore, it became expedient for Shiblon to confer those sacred things before his death upon the son of Helaman, who was called Helaman. Oh, great. Now we have a Helaman Jr. Fantastic. Being called after the name of his father. So we have Alma and Alma Jr. and Helaman and Helaman Jr. It's terrible. I'm getting new names. Now behold, all the engravings which were in the possessions of Helaman were written and sent forth among the children of men throughout all the land, save it were those parts which have been commanded by Alma should not go forth. Uh, I don't know what I'm moving on. Nevertheless, 
These things were to be kept sacred and handed down from one generation to another. Therefore, in this year, they had been conferred upon Helaman before the death of Shablon. So, okay, Helaman now, which I don't know which. Helaman Jr., I guess. I don't know. Yeah, I guess so. Helaman Jr., now has kind of this, like, secret wisdom that's been handed down from who knows where. And it came to pass drink also in this year. And there were some dissenters who had gone forth unto the Lamanites, and they were stirred up again to anger against the Nephites. Imagine. So it sounds like we have another war coming. And also in the same year, they had come down with a numerous army to war against the people of Moronaiha. Oh, yeah, that's uh, Moroni's son, Moronaiha. Uh, or against the army of Moronaiha, in which they were beaten and driven back against their own land, suffering great loss. Who was beaten? They. That's great. So we had a Lamanite army fighting the um, Moronaiha army, and they were beaten. I haven't the foggiest idea who. I'm guessing it was the Lamanites that were beaten because it said back again to their own lands. Yeah, sounds like, random side note, Lamanites aren't done fighting. Okay. And thus end the thirty and ninth year of the reign of the judges over the people of Nephi, and thus ended the account of Alma and Helaman his son, and also Shiblon who was his son. Okay, well, that's going to be the end for today, and, uh, oh my god, everybody, I just turned the page. All right, I got to find some music. Hold on, hold on. There it is. We just finished Alma. The book of Alma is done. It's awesome. <laughs> oh, you have no idea. It's like a big weight's been lifted off. Oh, this is this is a good day. What a great day. I am a fan of episode 55. I had all kinds of good news in the beginning of this episode. We got all kinds of good news at the end. Yeah, everyone, guess what? Next episode you hear, episode 56, will begin with the book of Helaman, which is great, since he just died. It should be the book of Helaman Jr. I mean, it's the same thing with Alma, right? It really should have been the book of Alma Jr. Anyway, great stuff. All right, we are we are really making progress. What does that mean? Let me see here. Let me hit home, my little e-reader. Ooh, 63% done, everybody. Mm-hmm. We're sneaking up on this thing. We are getting through it. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm all giddy now. I want to record another one. Now that I'm not reading Alma, I'm all excited. Anyway, doesn't matter uh, because we're done for now. I'm not going to keep going. Nope. You have to wait. Wait for the next one. But this was a lot of fun. So I want to thank everybody over at Mormon Stories. That Honestly, uh, it was it was a very pleasant experience, and I thought it was pretty fair. And um, even though we may ideologically d- differ on some things, I think it was a, it was a fair interview, and uh, I was asked some very direct questions, and I gave direct answers, and I tried to do it without being disrespectful. Apparently, some people thought it was disrespectful because, again, got some immediate one stars. But anyway, but thanks to them, and I also want to say thanks to uh, to everybody that supported the show. I want to say thank you to our newest goddess, Goddess Molly. You are awesome. Thank you so much for for coming in, and everybody else. You know, and actually, now that I think about it, uh, we're actually two dollars an episode away from like the third goal, right? To, to being able to, to give a larger donation to the uh, Taylor scholarship every month, $2 away. So yeah, it's just going to take one more priest or priestess. And I got to say, fellas, the ladies owned us this week. They really, they stepped up and we were all kind of, you know, we, we, we might've slept on the job a little. So if there's anybody out there feels like, wow, I want to be a priest. I want to be a bishop, or maybe you want to be a God. There is no male gods. No. Get the all of heaven, all of the Mimo heaven is being ruled by uh, by goddesses. Just saying. I mean, yeah. So anyway, I'm just saying we're super close. So if anybody wants to uh, take us over that over the edge, that would be awesome. And uh, yeah, and then we could actually get a uh, get more help to the people that need it. And I'll th- I, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. I'm gonna I'm gonna sweeten the pot just a little. Okay. So don't tell them this. These these uh, Mormon stories, guys. But I remember I said before, when I was doing the uh, episode with Bryce, I actually have the entire original recording that I did after I uh, played the drinking game in episode 52, I think. Is that right? 52, I think. Yeah. Where I just got like hammered because there was like nine beers in that one episode. So I have the whole thing and uh, I haven't listened to it, but I have the recording. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, I don't even think I'm going to listen to it. I don't even, cause that just sounds like work. Well, I might listen to it. I might edit a few things out. But I don't think I should. I think I'm just going to put it up raw and uncut on the uh, Patreon site. I'm going to make it only available to the uh, to the patrons. Because I'll be honest, guys, I kind of feel a little bad doing it because it's, I don't know, it seems a little bit disingenuous to put it up because they didn't want it aired. So it's not really airing. So if I do that, I would ask that all of you um, kind of don't just listen to it on the site if you want to listen to it. The, the uncut original drunk version of me on Mormon Stories. Uh, I don't know. It might not be entertaining. I barely remember doing it. But uh, I'll put it up. 
And I would just ask that uh, any of the contributors, the patrons that, that go there to listen to it, you know, don't try to download it or rip it and send it to your friends and stuff. Because, again, it's not really – it was never meant to be public, but I feel like I owe you guys this. And uh, so I'll do that for you guys for all the financial support that you give in the show. feel like I owe you one. And a lot of people have said that they'd really like to hear that. So I think I'm going to do it. Yeah. Okay. So there you go. If you were thinking about coming on the uh, on the bandwagon and contributing to the show and the Taylor Scholarship and you're like, hmm, just not sure – but boy, I sure would like to hear the uh, that first interview with uh, Mormon Stories. Now's your big chance, because uh, it will be available very soon. Okay, that's it for now. I'm going to go on and on and on like I usually do at the end. So in order to avoid that, I'm just going to cut it off right now. Great time today, and I can't wait to talk to you guys again. So for now, goodbye. This song is licensed for use within this podcast. All song and copyright information can be found at www dot my book of mormon podcast dot com